over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shalini. A very good afternoon to everyone who's logged in. I'm Nena. I'm an executive committee member of NPPA. And on behalf of Team, team NPPA, I welcome you all to this keynote address on the topic towards a universal and uniting understanding of well-being. Uh, the speaker for this session is Dr. Hans Hendrik Knoop. Dr. Hans is an associate professor and director of the Positive Psychology Research Unit at Aarhus University, Denmark. He also serves as an extraordinary professor at Optentia Northwest University in South Africa and as an associate editor at Frontiers of Psychology's Positive Psychology section. His work is focused on flourishing in education, work, and society with a strong interdisciplinary approach. His research within positive psychology has involved thousands of educators and leaders and data on well being from almost 300,000 Danish pupils. At Aarhus University, he has co directed the master's program for positive psychology for a decade and has hosted international conferences relating to education and positive psychology in Denmark for about nine years. Uh, he was the president of the European Network for Positive Psychology for two terms from 2010 to 2014. He has also served on the IPA Board of Directors from 2009 to 2016 and is currently serving on IPA's Council of uh, Advisors. Professor Hans has authored and co-authored more than 200 publications and has delivered more than 1,000 invited keynotes and lectures in Denmark and at conferences all over the world. He is also a frequent commentator in newspapers, radio, and television on matters of learning, creativity, ethics, and positive psychology. Uh, we thank you, sir, for being here with us. Uh, the chair for this session is uh, Dr. Snehalata Jaswal. Uh, Professor Snehalata is currently a professor of psychology at Sikkim University. From an army family, she completed her schooling in different Kendriya Vidyalas, fi finishing in Chandi Mandir. Uh, she graduated from GCG 11 and completed MA and MPhil from the Department of Psychology with positions in the Punjab University Merit List. She became a lecturer at MCM DAV College, Chandigarh, where she started the de uh, Department of Psychology and remained its head until she left. Uh, she has shaped the lives of several students and was chosen to be among eight creative teachers of the region by the Indian Express. She was also awarded the Shevning Fellowship in 2004. Uh, inspired by her sojourn in UK, she returned to get a PhD from the University of Edinburgh. The main focus of her current research is human cognition using experimental as well as correlational approaches. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Snehalata, and I kindly request you to take over. Thank, you very, you. thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be with you today. Uh, uh, can I share my screen? Yes, sir. I think we are already late, so we should start as soon as possible. And thank you for both the very good introductions, Nanaji. Uh, I think, sir, uh, we should start so that uh, audience is not kept waiting any longer. Please share your screen and start. Okay. All right. We are yes. looking forward to your talk. Yes, thank you very much. And great to be with you. Uh, and um, I will be talking today about um, the ideal of bringing humanity better together by, by combating uh, some of the the problems that connect to uh, the the multiple terminologies we have for well-being. Well-being is such a uniting concept. Well-being is something everybody strives for. Yet we have uh, hundreds of official definitions of well-being that overlap highly, but at the same time make uh, uh, scientific progress. Uh, more difficult and often uh, creates misunderstandings between people, uh, which are indeed pseudo uh, misunderstandings, and that may even lead to conflicts. So uh, this will be my approach today, and I will. Uh, I have. Um, I have three points to make. Um, first of all, I will argue uh, 
for a common concept of well-being that can be anchored in some basic conditions uh, that condition all human well-being and health. Uh, then I will just briefly show a quasi-representative selection of influential well-being definitions uh, to clarify how they vary, but also how there are common de denominators uh, between them. And thirdly, I will uh, present a new theory or an approach uh, to a, a more general uh, falsifiable theory of well-being that may be uh, able to bring some of these perspectives together in a fruitful uh, fashion uh, based on system theory, uh, humanistic psych uh, psychology, and, and uh, positive psychology. So here we go. Um, the, first, the first point about some very basic fundamental preconditions for human well-being are the following. They're very easy, but they are also very foundational for everyone. Um, and I have three slides to present that, that point. Um, this is the first one. And the point is simply that all living organisms are spontaneous self-organizing. That means if you're a plant, uh, you grow spontaneously if you have water and, and temperature and and soil and so in which you can grow. It just happens. If you are a dog, uh, you grow and you play and, and, and you live spontaneously and you all your organs, everything within your nervous system is organizing somehow by itself. Uh, the most of it completely be, be, uh, below the conscious threshold. So that's one thing. So this is, a, a very strong and foundational argument for the bottom up, if you will, if you will, a bottom up drive in nature in in this world, and we all depend on the the sense of freedom to apply this bottom up drive within us uh, as we live. So nobody really has a chance of uh, of uh, well being if being remotely controlled. If somebody is just remote controlling you and you have no say yourself. And we see that very clearly from the science on, on, on self-determination and freedom. And we see that reflected in the human rights declaration and, and so on. So this is, this is really important. People need freedom to act bottom up. Well, that's the first point. Second point, uh, almost the opposite. Um, all living organisms obviously are subject to binding conditions. For instance, the laws of nature, the basic needs for food and water and sleep and so on, which if not satisfied will kill you. So, so these are binding conditions and, and, and they are not free, they're not voluntary. You have to eat and gravity does pull you down. It doesn't lift you up and so on. These are binding conditions. So, so this is a top-down, this is kind of a top-down scheme that we are also confronted with and, and that it determines our conditions for life. And this means that we have to unite in order to, to thrive and, and, and be well and function well. We have to understand that all living organisms are depending on being able to self-organize, bottom-up, under binding conditions, top-down. So, 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 and and this is often difficult to grasp. It maybe not for you, uh, but uh, in, in your culture. But m many people tend to think dualistic rather than dialectic, as this um, makes for. This is both and. You you have to do both. So here's just an example of how. Uh, in education, which I have worked with for many years, uh, we may see this play out. So how. We are all born with a desire to learn, but there are also demands for learning in the educational system. So how can bottom up and, and top down be united there? One way to illustrate that is this. We have this demands for learning and creativity in society, the Indian society, the Danish society, where I come from. And we can explain those demands by economical necessity. We need a competent population by politics, politicians who agree that this is how the curriculum should be structured and so on. 
and there are scientific arguments uh, for the, having these demands also, because we have studies that show that if you have an incompetent population, you will not be able to compete and so on and so on. So we have these demands and, and, and the demands are top down on people. So how can this function uh, and how can this promote well-being? Well, by one th for one thing, uh, we may understand that uh, who we are meeting, when we create these demands, who, who are these demands uh, pointed at? And they're pointed at people, individuals who are born with a desire to learn and a desire to create and make a difference. How can that be explained? Well, by genes, you can see that for instance, all mammal, uh, all mammals play when they're young. You know, there's six thousand mammal species on the planet today. All their children play. The puppies, the little horses, uh, even the birds, they all play because that's a way of learning. So, so, so there's this desire to learn in 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 flourishing ways. We have also culture, the memes. Uh, of course, if all your if all your classmates uh, uh, are having computers or are interested in computers, you'll probably be interested in computer also. So you'll, you'll have a desire there. And then we have these these more personal and individual traits and interests and values and so on, our psyche, that also points in that direction where we have this clear experience that it's fun to learn and it's boring not to learn. So it's, it, 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 it's, it has this face validity. So... The, the interesting thing becomes how how may these desire to learn survive meeting the demands and and just to give you a few examples that are uh, important is if one thing we know for for certain is that if if this meeting has to work and has to be a win-win situation uh, where the individual the, the citizen meets the system in a win-win uh, uh, way uh, the, the citizen needs optimism, the belief that it's worthwhile even trying. Otherwise, you will not try. You need community. You know, all the happiest people in the world have communities. Uh, I have a sense of belonging, feel the warmth and the love of the surroundings, and so on. We cannot do without it. There's no meaning in life if there's no community. And then there's also no drive forward if there's no meaning. And then it presumes autonomy, the, the ability to actually uh, think for yourself and act for yourself within these frames. If these basic conditions, and you can see these very much reflect also a self-determination theory, uh, things will not happen. It will not be a win-win situation. And then I will add one more thing, namely that in order for this meeting to, to function educationally, we have to have equal consideration for individuality and community so the more we can we can <clears throat> support and promote the strength of an individual the, str the stronger the community is likely to be because a person who feels nurtured and, and cared for and respected for his or her individuality will inst uh, instantaneously and instinct instinctively um be um, likely to reciprocate that and, and contribute to the community. And also, um, if you function well as an individual, you'll get more uh, social invitations because people can see that you're flourishing. So, so you must be able to do something. You must be resourceful. So individuality and community has to, to be thought uh, together as a complementary dimension. And often we are blinded to that because our political metaphors and our political uh, thinking is often that uh, the right wing is about individuality and the left wing is about community or some nonsense. Nobody, no human being functions without individuality and respect for that and or without community. And if this succeeds, um, we may say that the, the, the sense you get is meaningful engagement, where engagement is this you may say it's, it's this feeling of bubbling within you, uh, driving, you know, interest in the world, go get it. And meaning, the meaning thing is about being part of this much greater uh, entity, this much greater whole than yourself. 
And meaningful engagement is a simple concept that almost everybody understands. So this I wanted to share with you as a first point, as a foundational uh, precondition for well-being. If, you, if people don't sense meaningful engagement in daily life, it will not happen. The difficult thing is that in order to get that, you need to combine these opposing forces of bottom-up and top-down. It's not one or the other. We have learned that from psychology also. Another way of putting it is that well-being presumes synergy between top-down and bottom-up forces. And we may ask again, looking at their children, uh, how may we ensure that the national desire to learn is not depleted through learning in schools and other places? It often does, but it's a shame and nobody benefits really from that. So we have to improve on that. Positive psychology is make, creating great strides uh, towards a better understanding and better practice in this. Um, okay, and, what, and, and how may we do that? By a better understanding of human needs, which I will come back to in a moment. I'll also give you this uh, citation from Bertrand Russell, the great philosopher, uh, who, who points to the, to the fact, the quite obvious fact, that curious learning is actually a safe bet. You know, and he puts it this way, that curious learning not only makes unpleasant things less unpleasant, because you come to terms with your problems. It also makes pleasant things more pleasant because you see new nuances and that makes for stimulation and fun and adventure and so on. So as long as you're a curious learner, you're very much on track in life. And just as all the happiest people in the world do have community and love in, in their life, uh, they learn something new every day. That is uh, some of the legacy from the late uh, Ed Diener, uh, who, who wrote extensively about that. The, the, the biggest uniting experiences for very happy people around the world is that they have community and they learn something new every day. So it's, it's a shame if that's taken away from children in school, of course. So we have a problem then that, <clears throat> this is my second point. Um, there are so many definitions of well-being, uh, yet when we study them, which I have done lately, they almost all agree that well-being means both well-being and well-functioning, being well and doing well. So well-being is really not the, the perfect term for it because it, 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 it relates to the well-being thing, but not so much to the well-functioning. But, but if we look at the definitions, uh, they regard both well-being and well-functioning. And I brought a little sample of overlapping influential definitions of well-being here. One is uh, the dynamic equilibrium theory. Well-being is viewed as a state of equilibrium and balance that can be affected in life events and challenges. This definition emphasizes the ability to maintain stability throughout life's ups and downs. And that means both functioning and being uh, well. Um, the, the well-known uh, World Health Organization definition, health by extension, well-being is defined as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of infirmity. This definition has been foundational, but also criticized for its ambitious breadth. Uh, the problem is not the definition as such, but that it opens for all these interpretations. Uh, and, and norms that you can take in there. Who Who is to say what complete is? When is it complete? You know, and is that even possible? And so on. And then the, the people discuss and discuss. And even though there's very uh, strong um, agreement on well-being and, and well-functioning being ideals for people, then it has been uh, recently uh, defined as the ability to adapt that to function almost Darwinistic in your in your environment um, uh, and, and manage uh, in the face of social, physical, and emotional challenges. Um, this perspective focused on resilience and functional capacity as central elements of well-being. Um, then there's a PERMA model that you probably all know, 
by Seligman, looking at different life qualities, the emotional, the emotions, the engagement, the relationship, meaning and accomplishment. And, and as Seligman says, everybody can say yes to that. And obviously, this is both about being well and functioning well. You can accomplish anything without functioning well. So it's, it's, um, and, um, and a last example, um, Antonovsky's uh, self-genetic uh, approach. This definition sees well-being as a continuum where focus is on health and resources and capacity rather than on disease, emphasizing an individual's movement toward greater health. So this is all, this is all about um, being well and doing well. They illustrate these definitions, they illustrate the complexity and multifaceted nature of well-being. Uh, reflecting its physical, psychological, and social dimensions, yet they all regard <clears throat> the combination of well-being and and doing well, being well and doing well, and 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 this is a this is uniting, and I'll try to build on that in a moment. So, um, I have I have put I have created a model um, which I will just um, uh, introduce briefly now with some. Uh, introductory perspectives and hope that this makes sense. It's a it's an attempt to 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 create common ground based on all these um, uh, aspects that I'm talking about here, uh, and create a theory that's falsifiable uh, and that are based on universal dimensions of well-being. And what do I mean by that? Well, the universal dimensions of well-being are those that are not different from uh, from, uh, for Indians and, and Danes and Americans and South Africans and so on. This is what unites human beings. And this has been a problem within um, positive psychology because po positive psychology attempting to be a strong science, of course, wants to create general insights in, into human uh, flourishing. For instance, a PERMA model uh, of Seligman is an attempt to say something about uh, humanity that uh, goes for every human being. So everybody need, wants uh, meaning, everybody wants engagement and so on. And, and one of the problems that are being discussed is, is oftentimes that, that people think that if we accept universal definitions, uh, we choke the sensitivity of context, the local context, and all the importance and the, the, the originality of the local con context and the local culture sort of disappear if, if we accept uh, the universal um, definitions and so on. And I will argue the opposite, acknowledging that it can happen that the universal just, is one, just degenerates into a one size fits all approach and all local diversity disappears. But the exact opposite is possible because if we, for instance, recognize universal human rights or uni universal basic needs, we, we get a very strong argument for actually providing every human being in all contexts um, satisfaction of these needs. So it becomes a, a, a resource for creating local contexts rather than overriding local contexts when we understand universals. That is my approach to this. Also, if, if we have a, a discipline like uh, positive psychology, it is much easier to argue that something is positive if everybody agrees that it's positive than if it is normative. If it's, you have your positivity, they have their positivity, who are you to say that something is positive? We can really only say that with full legitimacy if we can assume that what we say is positive is actually positive for everyone. So this is, this is another argument for looking at the universals within positive psychology. So, but first a few introductory uh, comments to that. Here, here is uh, Marcus Aurelius almost 2000 years ago, the, the Roman philosopher. Uh, he says, this is so beautiful. 
Uh, there's so much to live for. When you arise in the morning, think of what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, and to love. And, and the point here is that life is elementary interesting. We are born in a way that life is basically interesting. So when we end up with all this ill being and all these problems, when we create societies, there's something elementary that is lost and, and we should never lose sight of the, the, the quality that is there right for us and with us, I think. And when we look at here, here are just some pictures from where I live in, uh, in Denmark and here we are in Venice and the beauty of the world speaks for itself. You don't have to argue that this is a wonderful world. It's just, it's just wonderful. This is my father before he died four years ago. But there's no guarantees that all the wonderfulness uh, continues. The world is in a terrible state right now, as you all know. Uh, and here's a summary of from my colleague uh, Steven Pinker from Harvard University, uh, who has who is extremely uh, prolific and has written extensively about the progress of human beings while also uh, recognizing the grave dangers that we face. And here's a sum up from, here, from him on the future of humanity. One slide. Here's what he says. Though we have seen spectacular improvement in the human condition over the last centuries, not disregarding all that went spectacularly wrong as well. Further progress is by no means guaranteed. The laws of nature are indifferent to our well-being. With its continuous entropic push, its constant invention of pathogens, uh, its never-ending production of natural disasters. The limitations of human nature and the darker inclinations for dominance, revenge, callousness, sadism, and the capacity for neglect poses a collective threat. And bad ideas can have disastrous negative impact, as we see in the, the wars being waged right now, particularly those ideas that polarize and call for tribalism, particularly those. And even a concept like well-being can be a, can be a polarizing thing, as you all know, when, when you listen to some of the, the more hostile attacks on positive psychology. Um, so we, we, we have that problem also. So can well-being be a common ideal? Well, well-being is gaining increasing attention as many suffer despite material needs being met. What are we missing? The acknowledgement of universal sources of well-being, the acknowledgement that there's no opposition between acknowledging human universals and maintaining sensitivity to context, as I mentioned before. Um, and may human universal actually create a uh, unite uh, hu humanity for better, or can it also be for worse? Positive psychology is exploring human universals related to well-being, all of which regard human rights. Indeed, exploring and mapping the landscape of human universals provides some of the best arguments for honoring human rights and decreasing the risk of war and conflict and all that. Just one argument, what are human universals? What are examples of human universals? And do they really exist? Well, human universals is something is some, sometimes called human nature when it when it's about human beings. Um, it may also uh, be culture. Uh, for instance, uh, there are ideas about life and death in each culture, about uh, genders in each culture, about um, um, growing old and learning and starting young and and concepts like that. Uh, are across, are found across the globe. 
and they, 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 more than, I think there are about 500 human universals that are documented now, maybe even more. Here are just a few examples of groups of universals. For instance, there are culture and society universals. Uh, all human cultures have complex social structures, including kinship systems, social norms, rituals. These structures facilitate cooperation and social cohesion with, within groups. This is all over the world. Every one of the 6,000 cultures in the world have this. So it's assumed by anthropologists to be universal, a part of human nature. We need that in order to function. There are language and communication universals, languages uh, uh, where you share features such as grammar, symbols, and so on. I don't have time to go into it. I'll just mention it. There are psychological uh, universals. I should just mention those. Uh, core mental attributes such as basic emotional expressions that are universal, cognitive processes that are universals shared by humans global, globally. These universals form the basis for our ability to understand and predict human behavior across uh, cultures. They are biological and genetic universals. Uh, they are musical universals, even such as rhythm and melody and sort of that are found everywhere. And they are also moral and ethical universals. Certain principles such as fairness and harm avoidance appear to be universal across uh, human societies and cognitive universals once more. So these universals provide a framework for understanding communalities and human experience, despite the vast diversity uh, of cultures, uh, languages, and social structures. They highlight the shared aspects of human nature that underpin our capacity for cultural variation and creativity. This is, again, acknowledging these universal universals underpin our capacity for variation. It doesn't override it. So when we have these discussions in the psychology departments between the social constructivists and the natural science inclined colleagues and so on, we, we really, in my view, do not need to continue that battle. There's room for everyone and, and we can actually uh, support each other much more than has been the case. And if we look, uh, zoom in on positive psychology, also there human universals exist. And I will not go into that in detail, but just give you uh, some examples that I think you all know. There are these foundational uh, concepts of conditions and processes for flourishing and optimal functioning. Uh, there are universality and cultural considerations, uh, even though much of a positive psychology originated in the United States. It seeks to be a universal science, as a recent study showed here. You all know the character strength and virtues, I believe, and they too uh, uh, assume uh, uh, universality. That is the uh, legitimacy of that uh, classification. Uh, and um, applications and in interventions are tested for uh, generalized disability, how they can be applied across contexts um, in effective ways. So these are just a few examples of how uh, human universals are also um, ideals within positive psychology. So there are universal sources of well-being and well-functioning, and we should understand them. And of course, I can only say a few things about that today, but I'll mention some of the, the, the most important that I have worked with. <laughs> if you, the most foundational uh, that relates to some of the, the, the my first points about top-down and bottom-up is that it's, it's, found, it's foundational at the same level, is that if you look at nature system theoretically, uh, you may argue that there are really only two types of processes in the universe, two types of processes. There are balancing processes and there are growth processes. I don't have time to go into that, but balancing processes is about regulation and growth processes are about growing. 
about something improving, becoming bigger, or that may even be problems that, that grow. But the universe is a place where all, all things grow and everything tries to regulate. Um, and that means that if this is, if you look at this road here from Norway, the Atlantic road in Norway, uh, as a metaphor for life, and you have to navigate through life, you, you have to, in your car, you need to be able to regulate your speed and regulate your direction. And also you need to, to have a, a, a learning experience by which you grow and discover the world Otherwise, you will not be motivated uh, to take the trip in the first place. So this leaves us with two principles uh, for well-being. One is this one. To navigate well through the journey of life, you need to continuously be able to regulate, regulate direction and speed. That means a, a general precondition for a good life is active self-regulation. Note how close this ties with um, self-determination theory, with humanistic psychology, with the ideals of freedom shared by all of humanity, and so on. So that's the first very foundational principle. The second one is th this one. To enjoy the journey, you continuously need new experiences that integrate into coherent understanding of life. That means a general precondition for a good life is harmonious growth. That means a balance between all the new stuff you see, the differentiation, all the nuances, all the new, all the new things you discover, and the, the sense of identity, the sense of being yourself, being an integrated whole, being a person, even though things are changing all the time. Having this sense of identity. Mihai Chiksen Mihai, the, the father of flow, uh, and positive psychology to a degree, and was um, was very adamant about that. That harmonious growth implies this balance between differentiation and integration. This is a basic tenet be, be behind the theory of flow, where you have a focused, integrated perspective on something, completely immersed in something, while something new is happening second by second. Uh, this this is a recipe for optimal functioning and experience. Much of this comes from Maslow also, and their human the, the Maslow needs that you all know are today recognized as universal needs. And the point is here that we have everybody has these needs, even the most collectivistic cultures. Uh, treasure self-actualization if they are able uh, to, 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 to do that. People want to be originals. We don't just want to be copies of the system. Of course, we want to be part of family. We want to be to honor our tradition. We want to be part of the, the culture we are in, but we don't want to be clones. We don't want to be mere clones. We, we, we also want uh, self-actualization. We also want to be original people, and we can see that in North Korea, uh, we can see that in China, we can see that in Venezuela, and all kinds of cult cultures where uh, the collective, uh, collectivism is strong. Um, and and so, so today, uh, Maslow is regarded as a universal uh, theory on motiv uh, human motivation uh, based on these needs. And we're all motivated to satisfy these needs. Health, well-being, flourishing are induced thereby. So by satisfying these needs, we create thriving and health. We, we, we promote that. So here is the model that I proposed to you based on an article I wrote last year. Um, if we say that uh, thriving, well-being um, is a way of being healthy also. And, and this is an important uh, thing to, to notice. Um, you're not only, if, if, if you're thriving, if the doctor in a hospital tells you you are thriving, you're not just free of symptoms. You are actually having a life. You're not just on antidepressant. You are actually having a life with meaning and direction and motivation and so on. And this is a healthy state to be in. 
so more and more doctors here and also around the world uh, refuse to talk about mental health and physical health as two different things. They increasingly insist, it seems, that this is actually the same thing coming from a different perspective because everything that we experience as uh, mental health is based on physical processes. Uh, and if you think in certain ways, it clearly has psychosomatic uh, implications. So health and, and, and the science of thriving and the thriving of health is, more, is merging more and more. And as I said before, all the definitions in this regard tend to converge on uh, having to do with being well and functioning well. So what is uh, my, my general proposal here, my, the general model? Well, based on what I have talked about in my first and my, my second point, that we have these pervasive needs for freedom, for activity, for growth, and for self-regulation. And this is before we even start talking about Maslow needs or self-determination needs or anything. We have these pervasive needs for freedom, activity, growth, and self-regulation. And the prototype for this, I will argue and have argued, is play, learning, and creativity in the sense that all mammals play and human beings play. And if they have a good life, and if, if, they, if we are fortunate enough to have many flow experiences through life, that is actually a sign of us staying playful throughout life. And whatever need, and the, the second point here, that whatever need we are satisfying or recognizing that we have, and then being motivated and, and, and satisfied, a learning process is taking place under that. We, we create an experience and we learn from that. Uh, maybe not something important, maybe something we forget ag again, but it is a learning process. And it is also a creative process with small c, a creative process in the sense that I'm being creative right now also. I prepared this lecture for you, but I am improvising every word. So I'm not reading from a manuscript apart from when I read uh, from the slide. You can hear I'm improvising all the time. And what Noam Chomsky, the great linguist, found out uh, early on is that that human language is so immensely creative that if you take an ordinary sentence uh, from your daily life, like now I go to the kitchen in the kitchen, now I'll cook some food for you, and you Google that sentence, you'll probably not have one single hit, even though all the words are ordinary and trivial and it's an ordinary situation, what you said in detail will probably not uh, generate one single hit uh, on Google. That's how creative the language is. And, and again, if we are adaptive, if, if you are an adaptive organism uh, that improvises in your context second by second, that is demanding a, a basic prototype creativity of you that has to be recognized. And it's, it's, so this is before we start talking about the more, the better known needs. And what are the better known needs? Uh, that are, are those that I just mentioned for you. I'll just take an example with the physiological needs, uh, food, uh, nutrition, um, uh, water, sleep, uh, hygiene, and so on. And if we have a need, um, sorry, if we have a need, the first thing that happens is that we get motivated by it. So we are energized by having needs. The next thing to recognize is that needs may be undersatisfied. For instance, if you suffer from hunger, famine, or malnutrition or something, you are undersatisfying the need for food, obviously. But you can also oversatisfy it. As we all know, we can overeat. And today, many more people die from obesity in Africa uh, than from, from hunger. We've become much richer, but we have not uh, really tackled yet uh, how to uh, adequately satisfy our needs. Because from 
our, our instincts often tell us just to eat all this chocolate that's in the city, you know, if you can, because you don't know winter is coming. So good to have some pollster. We're not in that situation anymore. So adequate satisf satisfaction are within thresholds, just as if the, your medical doctor it makes a blood, it takes a blood uh, sample from you, the, he will analyze uh, all kinds of uh, dimensions and look at thresholds. Are your cholesterol below critical level? Are they above critical level and so on? Or are you in the normal area? We can think in the same way about um, needs. Are we within the threshold? Not too much, not too little. Um, and if we satisfy the need, we will have some kind of life quality, like the enjoyment of a good meal or new energy because I, I, I got the water I needed or whatever. And, and this, this, this makes for well-being. This is a source now of thriving and well-being. It's not the same thing, but it's like in the PERMA model. It's like you experience something and this creates flourishing or this makes flourishing, which is uh, a construct, a, a, a summarizing construct, uh, more likely. And then we can say the same thing for all the other uh, needs. The safety needs, uh, they can be met, then you can relax, uh, then you're more likely to thrive, concentrate on learning, social needs, you get friends, you get love in your life, then everything brightens up, you get esteem needs, you feel competent, you learn stuff, you, you, you can see that you're able to uh, be an acknowledged member within your culture and your family, that is good for your mood. And the self-actualization needs, same thing. I, I can do something. I can, I, I can do something that nobody else can do. I don't have to be Gandhi. I don't have to be Picasso. Uh, but I can do something uh, in, in the role of being a unique person. Nobody else has my place. So, so all of this is making for health and well-being. And when we have that, one of the criticisms within positive psychology has been that there's too little focus on context. What about the context that we're in? Well, the context may be hostile or promoting. It, it may be it, you, the, the context you're in, the political system, the organization, the workplace, even the family clearly may both promote and inhibit that all this happens. But if you look at it like this, you can see it's not really difficult to grasp this and it's falsifiable. We, we may falsify every hypothesis that is implied in every causal uh, arrow uh, in this model. So that's what I'm proposing to you as, uh, as my third point. Um, we may also put color on it and some like that better. So I did that here. Um, and we may relate this to, th these are human universals. These are human universals, psychological, physiological universals, I argue, as I have done. This is, this is uniting for all of humanity. So when we have this hope of, of fairness, uh, of respect for all life, of dignity for people, of liberty, work, education, as described in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you can see that all of this, all of this, if it's really acknowledged as being universal, is almost impossible to ignore when you write out these ethical documents for humanity. And this is a new challenge because the philosopher David Hume has convinced humanity for hundreds of years that you cannot derive norms from empirical facts. And, and it's true, you can't derive an ought from an is, he said. 
So you can create human rights based on science. Well, I will say that this was true until we got a science of well-being. And we can discuss when that started. But if you have a science on well-being, and you know that whenever you have a moral philosophy, it's about creating good frames for human beings and good arguments for how people should live and function together. When you have a science about that, you can see that it becomes more and more unethical to ignore the science when you create a philosophy. For instance, if you have a stoic philosophy, which can be wonderful, but if you have a stoic philosophy that tells you that you should just you should just accept your suffering and suffer as long as you can, and when it's over, it's over, and that was it. That is a noble ideal, has millennia on its back already. But if you know, if the doctor tells you that yes, you can suffer, but you will be in a heightened stress level if you do. And you can only be at a heightened stress level for a few days before your health starts to suffer, be, be, before it has health consequences for you. When you have that kind of science confronting philosophy, you can see that it becomes more and more difficult to ignore the science, even though science is not philosophy and philosophy is not science. So also philosophy and science have to meet also moral philosophy as exemplified in the Human Rights Declaration and science as exemplified in this model and in positive psychology need to come together. So, so this will, let me just see here, this, this, this will be my concluding words because time flies. I say it here again, science such as human universals and ethics such as human rights, must interact in synergy. The more we know about universal preconditions for worthwhile living, the stronger the ethical obligation for ensuring these preconditions become. So thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Noop, for this very engaging and illuminating talk. Uh, I think we can take a few questions now. Any questions? Anybody? There are no open questions as yet. I think I'll uh, begin, take the lead while other people organize their questions. Uh, so I'm very, very interested when you said that how can we achieve this? Uh, and you call it that we need to regulate the direction as well as speed, as well as the speed of our um, responses. So self-regulation, you say, is the key. And yet, uh, we also talked about balancing and growth processes as necessary to achieve this well well-being, which of course includes well-functioning also. So I, I kind of saw a little bit of, um, I would say, conflict there. When I'm talking of self-regulation, how do I actually talk about it in the same vein as when I'm talking about the growth processes? So self-regulation seems to be antithetical to the growth processes. And then how we achieve well-functioning with those. <laughs> well, I will say that it's not antithetical. It's not the... Um, when when you you when we are in the flow process for instance if a child is playing right uh, the the child is regulating all the time out of boredom out of anxiety trying to stay in flow so this is this is regulation but when you are in flow you are challenged to your optimal level which typically mean that you learn effectively you are energized you use your talents to its full potential and you're having fun in doing so so it creates strong impressions that you you're likely to remember so it's a personal growth process to be in flow 
uh, while you're regulating at the same time. Okay, that, that, that's that's a wonderful example. Thank you so very much. So anybody else who would like to ask a question, you can put it in chat also, or you can just raise your hand and go ahead, please. As I said, it was indeed a very illuminating talk. Yeah, there is a one question. Is there a connection between meaningful engagement and health? Jagjit Kaur. Sir, can you see the question? Is hmm. there a connection between meaningful engagement and health? Yeah, uh, I would say there's, there, are, there are many connections, but uh, the, the one, one way to say it generally is that the brain is a pattern seeking organ. Yeah. So we try to understand patterns connections between things how how do things fit together and when we succeed in that we sense meaning yeah so there are different levels of meaning the small time meaning like i know what you mean mm -hmm. i i know what you mean uh and and so that's one way to create synch synchronity uh between us um there's also in part of a profession, I'm a psychologist and I identify as a psychologist. And so there's a connection between me and my colleagues and my field. And, and this is meaningful. This is another pattern. And there's, there's also the big pattern with the universe when we have spirituality or uh, the, the scientific worldview or religion or something that somehow places us within the the very big hole so that with a little luck we feel at home in this larger home so there's meaning there also and again coming back to the flow example one of the reasons i think i've been working with chicks and mihai for many years he was my mentor for my phd and and he was uh, he's been a friend for many many years um one of the things I think that made his book on flow so popular was that he created a very special meaning by a narrative technique. And the narrative technique was that he took the most abstract there is almost, namely the second law of thermodynamics, a law on entropy, which seems to be a law governing all of the universe, the overriding law of the universe and he and it's a law of chaos that things move towards chaos and 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 less and less order and then he he describes the most concrete of all namely the conscious experience in these abstract terms using entropy and the antithesis to entropy called neck entropy and describes the flow experience as the opposite of chaos that the complete focus the complete immersion in one thing uh, in a wonderful way creating this optimal experience so by that narrative technique you get this sense of being a sand corn in the universe a grain of sand in the universe in the universe seeing the universe uh, in your consciousness while you do that that's that's a, that's a very deep sense of creating meaning i mean I, I don't know if he wanted to do that exactly but i suspect he did thank you uh another thing which comes to my mind is of course we've spoken about universals but how do you think that your proposal would contend with the diversity of cultures across the world so do you think this theory will stand despite cultural differences or you would feel that in some pockets of the world, maybe uh, something needs to be modified here or will change? My, my, my general answer is this. If you have something, if you have a human, human universal that integrates humanity, I'll use that word. It yeah. 
affects us. It's it's the same for everyone. We all need food and shelter and so on. So it, we have these universal needs. So that's universal. The uh, uh, ne necessary quality criteria when applying that to your local context, mm. that applying this universal generate diversity, generates originality, it generates um, differentiation. I can use Chick High again. He wrote about the evolving self. And he, there you have that point made also again and again, that if something is to be integrated in a well-being promoting way, it has to open up for differentiation. And so when you create many new things, much differentiation, people bec become anxious if it's not integrated in a whole. And the other way around, if you have something that integrates, like a human universal, but it squeezes all the local diversity away, it becomes totalitarian. Yeah. So we have to have this combination. Yeah. And we tend to think dualistic, and our language is dualistic, and our perception is, you know, the figure in the background, dualistic. We 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 cannot see the vase and the face at the same time. And so it's difficult to see integration and differentiation at the same time, but we need to learn that because it's a truth, I think. Thank you so very much, sir, for this very enlightening keynote lecture. Uh, we do have a tradition where we rarely ask questions after a keynote, but uh, you were so very approachable and I was so very interested that I thought we'll leave that tradition apart. And I can see Nana's there with us trying to tell us it's time over time over but it was such a pleasure to hear you thank you so very much for this experience thank, thank you sir. such an honor to be with you thanks for all your good work and i wish you the best of all hope to meet you in person one day yeah definitely thank you, thank you. over to you nana um, I would just quickly like to thank uh, Professor Hans for taking us through this enlightening journey of understanding a unified conceptualization of well-being. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and for being here with us. Um, thank you, Professor Smelata, for sharing the session and for sparing your time for us and for helping us bridge the gap between the audience and the speaker. Uh, I would also like to thank the audience for being patient and enthusiastic listeners, and we hope you continue to join us for the upcoming sessions. Uh, we will be taking a short break and we will resume at 2 p.m. for the keynote address by Dr. Nidhi Maheshwari from the Defense Institute of Psychological Research. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>